morning. Thanks for having me here. I'm Claire Wagoner. I'm an environmental program manager at the State Water Resources Control Board. So I work in the Division of Water Quality. Um, I'm a Long Beach grad, so go beach. <laughs> um, but I want to give you kind of a big picture of the impact that this workshop and this effort can have. Uh, I started at the State Water Board almost seven years ago as a secret fellow where they have scientists you know, get into policy. So I've been doing policy making for the past seven years, but I think uh, what I want to share with you is sort of what we need from the state, um, starting with Water Boards 101, who we are, what we do, sort of the regulatory tools in our toolbox to address water quality issues like microplastics. You just heard about the scope of the issue, so I'll sort of breeze by that. But I think I also want to share some success stories because this issue has emerged and there's been a lot in the legislature that's been happening and that gives me promise. Um, I think there's a lot more to do, but at least there's an awareness there, so I'll share some of those success stories. And then what our agency is doing, um, we're sort of in the nascent phases, phases of addressing microplastics, but I'll sort of share why and how that happens and why we're a little behind the times. Um, where we are, where we're going, and then sort of what we need from this group and what we can, what some of those outcomes and how they can be directly translated into uh, effective change for the state. So the State Water Resources Control Board is a regulatory agency. We have broad authority from the Clean Water Act, from Port of Cologne. We also have a division of drinking water that gives us authority for um, under the Safe Drinking Water Act and the um, Public Health and Safety Code. So at the State Board, we do a lot of statewide water quality plans and policies where we address issues. We can say on a statewide level, you know, here's a concentration of a pollutant that's no longer acceptable. And then we have our you know, kind of water quality programs. We can issue permits, but typically there's nine regional water quality control boards that implement the statewide policies. So um, we're in the LA region, down south, just across the channel is your Santa Ana region. But so your regional water boards take those policies and limits and rules and regulations and issue permits for discharges. And so that might be a national pollutant discharge elimination system permit or a continuous discharge requirement. But essentially what's in there is the concentrations at which these dischargers can put out into the ocean. So they have monitoring requirements. And then if there's exceedances, they can go and enforce on those. So you just heard about the scope of the issue, so I won't spend too much time here. Um, but really we're looking for microplastics we're finding them and you know the potential impacts I think is a question mark and there's a lot to do there but um, talking about the success stories at least now we're seeing an awareness for the plastics issue so the straw in the turtle's nose really opened some eyes it was very graphic but what we saw was that AB 1887 came out and this was an assembly bill where now we have straws on our customers we had the success of the ban on microbeads and rinse-off products. There's been additional funding for recycling facilities, so this is trying to get folks to increase recycling and increase opportunities for folks to recycle. There was a prohibition on non-recyclable and non-compostable takeout food packages at our state facilities, so this is our fairgrounds, our beaches, our parks. Uh, in 2008, there was a recognition that the industrial facilities that are producing the virgin plastics, so your nurdles and the stuff that goes into manufacturing, they were having spillages, there was some practices for some of those facilities where just inadvertently they were ending up in the water. And so the uh, legislature came together and had the State Water Board have a pre-production plastic debris program where we have eyes on that now. So there's inspections, you know, there's looking for best management practices, so this stuff isn't just getting out from spills from industrial facilities. I'll talk a little bit our, about our um, State Water Board trash amendments that came out and sort of the impacts on um, macro microplastics. And then recently we had SB 1263, which uh, Holly Wire is going to talk about, that's requiring the Ocean Protection Council to develop a plan for microplastics. And then also SB 1422, which requires the State Water Board to develop drinking water test methods for plastics and start monitoring. So this is, um, State Water Board adopted the trash amendments to the California Ocean Plan and the Inland Surface Waters Enclosed Basin and Estuaries Plans. And these are water quality plans that essentially give you the rules of the road for our waterways. Uh, but what this one in particular required was for 
Um, municipalities with stormwater discharges, they have a zero trash prohibition discharge. And so this was a pretty bold statement to say, we are no longer okay with water or with trash entering our waterways. So usually you develop a total maximum daily load and you sort of look at your waste load allocation for your various contaminants and you get a number above which all folks in the watershed can't exceed. For trash, we said it doesn't belong there. And so the TMDL is zero. It does address all uh, trash above five millimeters. So again, this is sort of the upper end of the microplastics issue, but from a perspective of at least we're doing something. So you can see down at the bottom there, those are the full trash capture, capture systems. So those slot openings can be no larger than five millimeters because it has to capture everything greater than that. So as stormwater enters the storm drains, these full capture devices are being installed in all of our municipalities in California, and they have to come into compliance no later than 2030. So again, it was a great way of saying, we, we can't do this anymore, it's a problem. So along with that was sort of this question that came up, well, how do you quantify trash? How are you gonna hold cities accountable for saying, you know, how much trash do you have? Do you identify these hotspots? We don't even really have a method for quantifying trash. So the Ocean Protection Council State Water Board is working with the Southern California Coastal Water Research Project and the San Francisco Estuary Institute on a project to really develop methods for quantifying trash. And so that study should wrap up next year. But it's a kind of starting to answer this question of, all right, well, we're gonna start holding people accountable. The thing we always hear as the regulator is, well, the method's too researchy, and so how do you know that the data is accurate? I spoke about Senate Bill 1422. This is one that's requiring us to define microplastics, microplastics in drinking water. So another thing that hangs us up is well, what do you mean when you say microplastics? You know, does it include this type? Because there's always a loophole for somebody to get out of. So we will be defining it coming in July. We have a public process, so we can sort of talk about how to engage in our public process for having input. Um, and then by July 2021, we have to adopt the standard analytical method and then require testing and then potentially issue a notification level or maximum contaminant level. So that's again getting at what number is acceptable and at what number do we know could potentially result in a risk to human health. And then the last piece is accreditation for laboratories, which I'll highlight in subsequent slides. So in terms of microplastics, I mentioned, you know, our state agencies just kind of picking up on this. We've had some of the regional boards do special monitoring studies, but we'll be addressing this through our constituents of emerging concern issue. This is our catch-all, knowing that there's 156 million registered chemicals out there, and our one-by-one -one compound whack-a-mole strategy isn't gonna work. So we're addressing microplastics through this effort because it kind of fits in this bin. In the past, we've had a bunch of expert panels sort of contemplate you know, how would you prioritize which emerging contaminants should you be looking at? So they developed a risk-based framework that says, is it present in the environment? Do we have a known concentration at which it causes potential impacts to human health or wildlife? And is there an available analytical method? And then if so, if you're seeing concentrations that are higher in the environment, then we have a health-based trigger level, it would screen on to monitor, and then we've been able to successfully add those to permits for monitoring. We aren't yet at that phase where we can say, and now at this concentration, you know, you're in trouble, but it's a great way of saying, all right, we're surveying the system, and now we know it's an issue. So we'll be, as I mentioned, uh, addressing microplastics through this effort, but we may have to adjust that sort of framework that we've used because plastics are a little bit different. So how this effort can really help us, I mentioned we get a lot of pushback for the method being too researchy. And what I always say, because I you know, was in academia a long time ago, is you can't tell me that you know, this professor who's the leader in his field is not generating good data because he's not ELAP accredited, you know, or that he's not using a standardized EPA approved method. All it's about is you know, making sure you have the appropriate quality assurance checks. And then for this effort, because what I'm hoping we can get out of this is a, a method that folks agree on so that we as the state can say, okay, discharger X, and now thou shalt 
go monitor this. Sorry, Violet, but it might happen. <laughs> <laughs> I, I knew we were going to talk about that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> the on the wall. Uh, there's a public process, so it's not set in stone. But um, a standard operating procedure. You know, you all may do things subtly differently, but if you can start to come to consensus and say, you know, we think this, this method's okay, or like, you know, why we recommend this, we want to know, you know, how are you going to identify the size, shape, type, and quantity of microplastics? And then in a variety of matrices, because we have that mandate to do it in drinking water by 2021, but we also know this is an issue in our surface water, could be in groundwater, uh, wastewater, stormwater, sediment, and tissue. And with each of those, you're getting an increasingly complex matrix. So, you know, how is your standard operating procedure going to change depending on your isolation techniques in those various matrices? So in developing the standard operating procedure, we got to think about from the very beginning when you're collecting your sample all the way through um, to the end when you're interpreting that. So you know, what's the best practices for going to collect it? Are we using amber glass? Does that amber glass have a glass top? Does it have a Teflon lid? What does that look like? Um, when you get into preservation and holding time, are there certain sample preservation techniques that are going to help maintain the integrity of the sample? Are there others that might degrade it? And increase the plastic fragmentation. For holding time, we know the plastics are really good at hanging on, but is there a point at which we should be analyzing it so we don't compromise the sample integrity? Um, all the way I talked about isolation, you know, are we gonna need different standard operating procedures for various matrices? As we go to analyze the samples and we start to talk about shape, you know, are we gonna come up with categories for talking about, you know, what shape it goes into so that at a statewide level when we're characterizing stuff, you know, everybody knows what we're talking about. Same thing with data reporting. Um, and then all the way through data interpretation. And then at each step along the way, it's imperative that we have quality assurance checks or quality insurance provisions set in there. So especially because plastics are ubiquitous, how can we demonstrate that the plastic was in the sample and it wasn't compromised in our process somewhere along the way? So, you know, having your field blanks, lab blanks, trip blanks, equipment blanks, all of those things are going to be really important um, and making sure you didn't contaminate your blank, you know, all those things. So, uh, these are the things that really help us uh, move towards somebody saying it's too researchy and so what we can counter with, well, actually, we know they're generating. So sort of the next level on this is our quality assurance project plans. We talk about this sort of like a, a recipe or a cookbook, and then within that cookbook, you got a bunch of recipes for generating great data. We use um, <coughs> the EPA guidance for this, and so this is just an example of some of the elements you would want in there associated with your method. Your project management, who's in charge, your chain of command, um, chain of custody, I talked about different standard operating procedures. Maybe you have one for your sample collection. Maybe you've got one for your wastewater method. All of this stuff goes into your quality assurance project plan, including data assessment and oversights, data validation steps, so that when somebody comes to you and says it's too researchy, it's you know not valid because it's not accredited, you can say, I'm sorry, but look at all this. You can't refute this. So what this enables us to do is include monitoring requirements and permits. So we actually were successful with this with our recycled water program, where we don't have necessarily ELAP accredited methods or ELAP accredited labs or EPA approved methods. We're getting there, but in that transition, we already know it's an issue, and so we wanna make sure that you know we can require this in permits so that we can at least quantify the problem. So I mentioned laboratory accreditation. Uh, this is probably a little ways down the road, except for in the drinking water, where we're gonna have to do this process soon, within the next year. So the first step's your standard operating procedure, then you have to validate the method with an interlaboratory validation, or interlaboratory calibration study. Then at that point, the water boards or EPA or a consensus-based approving body like ASTM can approve the method for use. We can request that our environmental laboratory accreditation program accredit, offer accreditation for it, and then eventually labs can get this accreditation and demonstrate competency. So this is a program that we have at our um, at the water boards to show that if somebody has a permit requirement, 
you know, on our end, we want to make sure the labs know what they're doing so we can have faith in that number. But from the discharger side, you know, if you're getting exceedances, you want to be able to sh be sure that those data are real. So typically this is used when we're at the point of compliance monitoring of a water quality objective, um, a maximum contaminant level, something where there's a limit that you need to hit. But eventually, you know, if we're going to address this for microplastics, this would be something we would want to offer. And then for microplastics and drinking water, this is something we're going to have to do by uh, 2021. So um, we already heard a little bit about potential impacts to human health and wildlife, but this is really sort of the next step. So the first piece for us is occurrence and saying it's there. But we've also heard from folks say, so what? You know, <laughs> things can excrete it. Show me it's a problem. And so we know there's issues associated with ingestion and sort of the feeling of false satiation. There's potential issues with those sorbed contaminants. Um, but really what we need to know is, is it present at a concentration of concern? And how is that gonna differ based on the plastic type, shape, um, all of the characteristics that we're trying to quantify because those questions are gonna come out. And as a state agency, we can, um, you know, try to do something about it, but the more information we have to say, look, it's being found and it's causing a problem, that second piece is where we really get traction. And you've seen, you know, the assembly bills where people call their senators, they don't want plastic straws and sea turtles. In this case, they don't want to be eating a credit card full of plastic every month or whatever that metric is. And so you can really start to tell your story of why it's a problem and why you should care. Um, I come from the environmental side of things where I'm like a fish and frogs person is what we get called. <laughs> but a lot of people, when it comes to human health, that's when they perk up and that's when the legislators will take action because you know babies are at risk, pregnant women are at risk, and then you've got real issues. Coffee's here. Yay. <laughs> and I'll, I'm uh, about to wrap up. So we're hiring. So I'm putting a plug in. We're hosting a California Secret Fellow. It's directly related because these two positions will have the opportunity to work on microplastics. So you would be paid to work on these issues. We also work on a broad suite of other water quality issues. But if you want to work with us on addressing emerging contaminants in California, um, come talk to me or Laura McClellan. We'll help you there. <coughs> And then my last plug, I know this is preaching to the choir, but I think it's really an important thing to say. For me, I work at an environment, I work under the branch of California EPA. We work in an environmental field, but we have an annual picnic and somebody in our land disposal program took it upon herself. She was so bothered by the waste we were generating. She started bringing a stack of reusable dinner plates. She had a trailer on her bike. She brought compostable utensils and she said, bring reusable stuff. And this is the picture. She would bring a cooler. Our food waste would go in the cooler. She would bring it home and compost it. The uh, watermelon rinds went to her chickens. <laughs> now we're five years later, and last year everything there was zero waste um, picnic, which for 170 people, starting to just raise that awareness of, yeah, we work for a, an agency. Why, why would we use single-use plastic? Like, start to make the change. I just bought myself these, which I'm really excited about. <laughs> I travel a lot for work, and I was bothered by plastic at all of my meals, so I'm like, I can throw this in my purse, it's easy. So it's our responsibility to make good consumer choices because we drive that change, and we're stewards for our community, we're stewards for our environment, we're the problem, we're also the solution, but it's our job to be the voice of this problem. And you know, a lot of people are like, there's a lot of problems. But this is one that we can kind of share, like, it's small changes. And so I encourage you to be those people in your community and then also take action on your campus. Because what you saw on the earlier slides of we actually got stuff done, and it was because people went and talked to their senator or legislator and was like, yeah, this is a problem we need to stop it. So with that, um, I think we're taking questions at the end. So we will transition to Holly Wire with the Ocean Protection Council.